Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Elizabeth Harbin. I'm the director of the Charles Center, and we are sponsoring this talk in collaboration with our friends at the Reeves Center. Um, I think it's really appropriate that we're at Reeves this afternoon as we're welcoming Sophie Neiman, um, because Sophie, who is a native of Baltimore, really started down the career path that has led her to be a working journalist in Africa as part of an undergraduate study abroad experience. So Reeves is home of all of our study abroad programs, our global oh, education fantastic. office. So it was a study abroad experience in Africa that first began to plant the seeds that have led to her becoming a professional freelance journalist based in Uganda. And today we are lucky that she's going to tell us some of her work um, concerning an, the coming of an oil pipeline to Uganda. Um, that she's been working on for quite some time as a grantee for the Pulitzer Center um, and I think in other projects as well. So we're also grateful to the Pulitzer Center for helping make Sophie's visit possible and thank you all for making time to come today. Hello and welcome and thank you so much um, for being here. Today in They Don't Want Our Work to Continue, activists in Uganda's contentious oil region I want to tell you about the human costs of resource development and a massive oil pipeline that is quite literally dividing Uganda. In 2018, Jealousy Mugisha drew up a list of 10 goals for his family to be accomplished over the next 10 years. A father of seven, he wanted to send his children to a good school. He hoped to raise goats and pigs on his farm in Bulisa district, a rural region bordering the western edge of the Nile River. But at the same time, plans for the East African crude oil pipeline were also being drawn up, soon to be the longest heated oil pipeline in the world. ECOP will run some 900 miles underground. Executives say this minimizes the disturbance it cause, causes from Uganda's western border with the Democratic Republic of the Congo out to the Tanzanian coast. There, petroleum will be loaded onto tankers for export. This map shows the majority of the pipeline, but it also extends further north with two drilling fields dubbed Talinga and Kingfisher and a series of feeder pipelines expanding outwards above like a strangely shaped T. The French oil company Total Energies holds a 62% stake in the pipeline project and the state owned China National Offshore Oil Corporation holds another 8%. Uganda and Tanzania, for their parts, have agreed to split the remaining shares, while Uganda will operate an oil refinery in Hoima, which also marks the pipeline's starting point. 178 villages in Uganda alone stand to be cut apart by this massive project, and my friend Jealousy is a member of just one of 3,000 Ugandan households that stand to lose at least part of their land to this pipeline, while another 10,000 families in Tanzania will also be impacted. The project has been criticized from dissenters, ranging from international oil, international environmental organizations to grassroots human rights defenders. But the Ugandan government and even Total Energies have decried critiques of their oil ambitions as neo-colonial, arguing that Uganda has the right to profit from its fossil fuels, just as Western countries have done for generations. They've also promised that oil will bring new development and prosperity to the region. I spent more than a year researching and reporting on oil in Uganda. I traced the pipeline's initial path from Congo to Tanzania, meeting villagers who told me that they'd been intimidated into giving up their land, who said that payment for their property had been delayed or wasn't enough. I was shepherded by activists who'd been arrested and harassed and warned me that their lives were in danger. After a while, I got used to speaking about this pipeline in a whisper. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you the stories of just a few project affected of just a few of these project affected people in the hopes of putting a human face to international resource development. In doing so, I also want to give you a front row seat to how reporting gets done, as well as thorny questions of objectivity that arise in journalism when confronted with human rights abuses and stark losses. And finally, by speaking about some really brilliant activists who have become dear friends, I want to convince you that there is still a reason to be optimistic, even in seemingly dire situations. But more on that later. Now, back to my friend Jealousy. Jealousy lives on a plot of land set aside for the Talinga project, under which much of the drilling for ECOP will take place. Because his home was shared with relatives, Jealousy was designated its secondary owner, 
eligible only for cash compensation for the surrounding land. Jealousy refused, adamant that the $950 offered was not enough to replace his lost 13 acres, and he demanded a new house. Fearing he would not receive proper justice in Uganda, Jealousy took his complaints to Paris, where the French branch of the NGO, Friends of the Earth, was suing Total Energies for failing to comply with environmental and human rights regulations in Uganda. Jealousy appeared as a witness in that court in late 2019, speaking about the home oil had taken from him. Upon his return to Uganda, things took a turn for the worst. First, Jealousy was detained at Entebbe Airport for some nine hours as officials interrogated him about his supposed opposition to development. Water leaked into the room where he was held, he later told me, and he nervously refused food and drink. Then, the Ugandan Attorney General placed the money offered by Total Energies in a court account and summoned Jealousy and a handful of other, resi of other residents in Belisa, um, where the Tilinga project will take place, all alleging unfair compensation, to come to court and plead their case. As the trial dragged on, it became difficult for Jealousy to feed his family. We are suffering, he wrote in a desperate letter to Total Energy some two years ago. With the Paris court case held up as a result of the coronavirus, the Ugandan court, case, the Ugandan court ruled against Jealousy and the other Belisa residents. His appeal is ongoing and inconclusive. In the meantime, he moved in with his adult daughter the family sharing one room divided by a dusty curtain. Before oil, I was planning for my sons, he told me. We are very worried oil will leave us poor, poor people. Work on the Talinga Project Central Processing Facility has been a new source of woe. Machines clearing the land for construction have sent a fine whirl of dust into the air, which is inhaled by villagers, and settles on cassava left to dry in the sun. In the spring of 2022, 300 Belisa residents petitioned Uganda's min Ministry of Health, claiming the dust had made children ill and caused accidents. Rains began in late July, and flooding combined with runoff from the same facility destroyed a shared garden in which local residents were growing watermelons and mangoes. The community erected a fence of thorns to prevent children and animals from wandering into the flooded area. The brown water has a foul, foul smell a few rotted fruits are the only sign of a once thriving community garden. A letter sent by Mugisha and other Belisa residents in April and August of 2022 to, total, to the Total Energy's office in Uganda complained of damaged crops and, cr and floods unlike any they'd seen before. The company promised to compensate residents, but when I spoke to Mugisha about this in November, he said that money had, yes, had yet to arrive. So. I first became interested in ECOP in 2019 when I heard about Jealousy's initial detention in Entebbe. I was weathering the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic at my parents' house in Baltimore, Maryland, feeling utterly powerless and wondering if the bedroom walls I'd painted bright yellow age 11 were actually a metaphor for me slowly going insane. With time on my hands, I read everything I could about this controversial oil pipeline. I was obsessed. I was desperate to see for myself what was happening, to understand firsthand the cost of oil to Ugandan communities. When it became safe to travel again, I pitched an article to the New York Review of Books, convincing an editor to allow me to return to Uganda, where I'd previously covered politics, and dig into the impacts of oil development. I also applied for funding from the Pulitzer Center, as additional money was necessary, given the scope of the reporting I wanted to undertake and the travel I knew would be, would be necessary to do so. Then, in late summer of 2021, I began investigating. In a year-long project with multiple trips to Uganda's oil region, I found that Jealousy's complaints of intimidation, of harassment, of unfair compensation, of grievances left unanswered were repeated along every step of the pipeline's long route. This is Edward Kozibwo. He's a farmer and father of six, living in, living in Simbabwe village in Masaka, central Uganda, one of 10 Ugandan districts that will be torn apart by ECOP. During the land acquisition process for this area, oil executives established a cutoff date. Farmers like Edward were told they would not be compensated for any crops planted after a final survey about four years ago. As it became pointless to cultivate the perennials on, once had once, on, on which they had once relied, such as coffee, cassava, and eucalyptus, Farmers like Edward were relegated to raising seasonal crops, which take only three months to grow and fetch a lower price at market. 
In the meantime, payment for his land was held up as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and funding negotiations over the pipeline itself. When I first arrived in Zimbabwe in 2021, Edward told me that he struggled to send his children to school as a result of these payment delays. His wife had died in childbirth while waiting for oil money. What if I also die without receiving anything? He asked in August 2021. When I returned a year later, he wondered again when he would be paid. Quote, I stopped growing everything expecting to get the money, he told me. We walked to his coffee farm, now untended and overgrown, a wooden stake marking the pipeline's path, poked out from among leafy bushes. Now, Total Energy says it began compensating people in about the spring of last year, and claims that more than half the people who stand to be impacted by ECOP have now been paid. The company also says it added a 30% disturbance fee to promise payments, plus an additional 15% for two of the years people spent waiting in hopes of plugging any income gaps. But farmers like Edward, who finally received his money this October, say that this is not enough to buy new land. Compensation rates were set by Total Energies in about 2018 and 2019, and since then, the, pro the price of land in Uganda has soared, along with the global cost of living. So much so that residents of Edwards Village received land, at about received land compensation at about half the market rate for the area, according to one activist I spoke to. And he's not the only one. Here's what a woman from Zimbabwe Village said when I asked her about the impacts of petroleum development in 2021. Quote, this project has come and destroyed everything we've worked for, she told me, adding that she was scared to criticize it further for fear of government reprisals. And such fears are not unfounded. Dozens of project impacted people I spoke to alluded to intimidation at the hands of oil workers, saying they'd been pressured into signing over their land whether they wanted to or not, and told that whether they wanted to or not, oil construction would continue because the government had willed it so. One man described a high-level Total Energies employee mocking him during a meeting in Belisa District after he asked about compensation. A Hoima resident said that oil workers threatened to withhold money if he protested proposed compensation rates. Now, it's important to note the political context in which this is actually happening. This is an image of a pro-oil protest, rumored to have been government-sponsored. Indeed, on this day, police marched calmly beside youngsters, a rare occurrence in Uganda. President Yoari Museveni has ruled the country for nearly four decades, often stamping out any critical voices. He's referred to the petroleum that will soon flow through ECOP, expected to bring in revenues of $70 billion over the project's 25-year lifespan as, quote, my oil. And in recent years, the regime has become more outwardly violent. This is pop star turned opposition leader Bobby Wine. In late 2020, at least 54 people were killed during protests over his detention at a campaign rally. And in the months surrounding the 2021 presidential elections, hundreds of opposition supporters began to disappear. Plucked from street corners and markets, they were shoved into unmarked cars and herded into prisons and so-called safe houses around Kampala. Those that reappeared spoke of torture. Some two dozen are still missing, according to members of the opposition, likely dead, while periodic abductions continue. And this repression has extended to activists and human rights defenders, speaking out about the risks associated with oil development. This is my friend Max Walatuhora, a human rights and environmental activist in Uganda. Max was first jailed in May of 2021 while guiding the Italian journalist Federica Marci through Belisa to interview farmers about the impacts of the Talinga project. As he was being arrested, Max said, a police officer told him that Total Energies had been asking about him and threatened that he would rot in a jail cell because of his work. Security forces then took his phone, recorder, and notebook and locked him up for two days. Upon his release, Max was charged with unlawful assembly in order to report monthly to the police on bond. We met a few months later. Still shaken from the arrest, Max pointed to armed police as we walked as we sped through the oil district of Hoima on the back of his motorcycle, saying he worried that a hired truck would run him over. One night, sitting in a bar with a recorder hidden under my plate and speaking in whispers, he again confessed his fears to me. Quote, I am most likely to be poisoned. If I die, I fear I will have, I fear I will have failed to defend my people, he said. Max's opposition to oil is not just about the pipeline itself or about his own security as someone publicly fighting it, but about the future of communities who have long relied on this land. 
He comes from a region where oil will soon be produced and vividly recalls how the proceeds from his family's crops provided for his education. That was the only way out, Max said. The land is the only resource we have as poor people. The land is a sign of independence to our community. It is a source of identity. Max is not alone. In August of 2021, a few months after his arrest, the Ugandan government closed dozens of nonprofits, accusing them of a range of missteps, including failing to comply with official regulations. Among the shuttered organizations was the African Institute for Energy Governance, or AFIEGO, a prominent environmental group with connections across the country. Its director, Dickens Kamugisha, exists, insists that the accusations leveled against Afiego are baseless, but six of his staff members were arrested in October of 2021, detained for, quote, illegal oil sector operations, and charged with operating without a permit. The issue is not the law, Dickens said of the arrests. The issue is that they do not want our work to continue, a remark that provides the name for this talk. When Dickens went to negotiate his employee's release, he too was thrown in a cell where he spent three nights. It was cramped inside and difficult to sleep. Low-level harassment, harassment has also continued. Afiego workers are sometimes forced to spend a day at the police station and then released without documentation, Dickens told me, making it difficult to follow up on claims of abuse. He too is afraid for his safety. These guys can kill you, he said of Ugandan security forces. There is no doubt about it. Now, the Ugandan government brokers no dissent about its oil ambitions. Last year, the European Par Union Parliament called for ECOP construction to be halted for at least a year, so allegations of abuse might be properly addressed. At the country's annual oil and gas summit, Museveni decried the European MPs as arrogant children, while calling for oil development to continue. When a small group of university students took to the streets to demonstrate their support for the resolution and their opposition to the pipeline, they were quickly and roughly arrested, photographed here. So, after about 18 months difficult reporting, I requested a meeting with Total Energy's executives in Uganda. In the Kampala Cafe, I met Martin Tiffin and Mary Beg Scheifer, the general manager of the ECOP project and the Total Energy's NGO coordinator and human rights manager, respectively. In a moment of seeming obfuscation, Tiffin would only speak to me if I showed him quotes prior to publication, something I try very hard to avoid as a journalist and that many outlets even forbid. And Beg Schaefer declined to be quoted at all. In our meeting, Tiffin countered claims that people had been insufficiently compensated and praised the amount of money being offered to Ugandan farmers. But when pressed on issues of possible intimidation during the compensation process, Total Energy said it could not comment without being provided the names of aggrieved parties. Quote, we can only respond to and investigate claims if we know what the allegation is about, Tiffin wrote me in a subsequent email. Quote, only facts can be investigated. We do have grievance mechanisms and those are meant to be used, he added, seeming to hint that people with complaints should come directly to the company, which it should be noted people like Jealousy had, and that doing so might be more effective than my publishing the allegations. As a journalist, I should say that this put me in an exceptionally difficult position. Though my sources understood that I would ultimately print their stories, many asked to be anonymous. I felt I could not safely bring those names to Total Energies, but the company's refusal to then comment on reports of very credible harassment meant that a raft of allegations essentially went unanswered. Statements made by Tiffin and Big Schaefer during our hour-long meeting were also troubling in and of themselves. For example, the company works closely with the same security organizations accused of harassing activists and makes no secret of those relationships. Total Energy's representatives told me that they coordinate with the oil and gas police established to patrol the project area on a daily basis. An April 2022 company bulletin boasts of police training sessions, but provides few details on what these actually entail. Tiffin and Big Schaefer also indicated that the oil giant can leverage its close relationship with Ugandan officials and security force, forces to protect human rights defenders, explaining in our meeting in Kampala that if the company hears of possible demonstrations in the oil region, it will encourage protesters to remain calm and counsel the police not to intervene. Nonetheless, they assured me that 
They assured me that total energies frequently raises respect for human rights and freedom of expression in conversation with Ugandan officials. CAO Patrick Peone even wrote directly to President Museveni to express concern about, Ma about Maxwell's arrest. But anything more direct, Total Energies maintained, would be a violation of Uganda's sovereignty. General remarks made to me by the company, however, lent credence to reports of intimidation. I guess we'll have time to respond to your article after publication if necessary, Tiffin wrote me in an email after our meeting. So. How does a journalist pull together a year's worth of allegations, making sense of so many interwoven stories, keeping dozens of sources safe, and hoping she doesn't get in too much trouble with a company with a net worth of about $157 billion? My work began by gathering the accounts I told you today, along with dozens more. All were consistent with the claims of intimidation and harassment I described, and I ultimately reported on. But in addition to the ethical dilemma of bringing names to, to, to Total Energies itself, I quickly realized, perhaps because of the pervasive nature of intimidation in the oil region, many people were unwilling or unable to name specific employees of Total Energies when accusing them of bad behavior. So while documenting new abuses, I also compared them to already public reports made by organizations like Friends of the Earth and Oxfam. As a result, much of the verification process for this article took place in off-the-record meetings and calls, ensuring my findings closely matched those of other researchers who also cannot be named for fear of jeopardizing their ongoing work. After my first trip to Uganda's oil region in the summer of 2021, I also kept in constant contact with sources like Jealousy and Max, monitoring the dangers they faced and the shifting situation on the ground while attending a graduate program in the United Kingdom. Then, in, the, and then, in September of 2022, I returned to Uganda. I found the situation largely unchanged, if not worse than on my first visit. And that's when I decided it was time to bring my findings to Total Energy's executives and high ups in the Ugandan government, who, it should be noted, were equally evasive in their answers to my questions. At last, it was time to write. And this brings me to the question of objectivity I alluded to at the start of this talk. And I believe that the answer in a situation like this one, where the abuses seem so clear and the power dynamics so uneven, is that pure objectivity itself would have been a mistake. At the very least, objectivity could not be neutrality. Now, it should be noted that my reporting already had a perspective. Indeed, much of my work was aided by activists who guided me safely through the oil region, which I acknowledged in my writing. But beyond that, to present a major company and government deeply invested in fossil fuel development as equal opposites to farmers who'd been dispossessed of their land and activists thrown in jail, rang false. In other words, in my mind, the facts were very clearly on the side of activists and farmers. Truth, then, came not from presenting myself as a so-called neutral observer, but from working tirelessly to document and verify near undeniable allegations. A purely objective or neutral approach itself would distort the reality I'd witnessed. Of course, I understand the impulse towards objectivity, especially in an age when we are so often flooded with too much information and misinformation at that. When I first began my reporting career in Uganda, I tried to rinse my mind of opinions, as if doing so would make me a better journalist. Now, I'm not so sure. It is our job to be accurate, certainly. We should not hope for or push for a given outcome. But truth does not equal neutrality, and I'll say that again. Truth does not equal neutrality. What I want to encourage today, whether you are considering a career in journalism, academic research, or have just wandered into this talk to take a break between classes, is to treat empathy and compassion with the same importance as you do objectivity. Of course, you should face any work with an open mind. You should be critical in your analysis. But just as important are, the hum are human stories, connections, and experiences. And it is crucial to hold those up whenever possible. After all, while the destruction caused by a massive oil pipeline may seem far off or even difficult to comprehend, far more universal is the fear of losing a much-loved home or even frustrations caused by insufficient pay. So, where are we now? Um, a quick interlude to say that this is the Total Energy's sort of petrol station that was about a block from my apartment in Kampala, and I swear this like haunted me the entire time I was writing. I'd <laughs> sit in my apartment in the middle of the night, like drinking a coffee or a beer and writing, and then look out the window and I could see Total Energies. But anyway, on to more serious things. I completed my reporting on oil in December, and after a few final fact checks, 
in the Nairobi airport and then on a snowy stretch of London Road, I published. When an issue becomes all you think about for months on end, it is strange to see it on the, in the world, the impact of your work suddenly uncertain. And at present, oil development in Uganda and Tanzania are actually ramping up. In February of last year, the government signed a final investment decision over the pipeline. At a ceremony in Kampala, Total Energy CEO um, Patrick Peone again praised President Museveni. The same month, the home of activist Kainga Mudu Yishitu, who works in Masaka and is another friend, was ransacked by uniformed men resembling security forces. Construction is expected to begin this year and perhaps this month, bringing with it another range of risks from increased accidents caused by roads traffic to the possible sexual exploitation of women and girls in the area. Meanwhile, the Ugandan government has announced a new round of licensing allowing companies to bid on potential oil blocks. I haven't spoken about the environmental impacts of this project, which stands to emit, I believe, about an additional 379 tons of carbon over its lifespan, but they are many. Activists also remain in danger. Max, for example, moves constantly from place to place. He says he struggles to trust friends, that he misses his young children. But I also told you that there are some reasons to be hopeful, and I do believe there are. The case against Total Energies in France, in which jealousy was a plaintiff, has finally resumed, as has a new court case accusing the company of greenwashing. Coalitions of grassroots activists and their national campaigners have also united to target big banks and insurers in hopes of convincing them not to fund ECOP and so disrupt the pipeline project. I draw the most inspiration and hope from the stories I told you today, from the commitment of activists to continue their work, whatever the cost. As a result, I want to leave you with this quote from Max and a reminder to be empathetic in your work and to look for human stories in all you do. Thank you so, so much. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here, and I'm, I'm delighted I got to chat to you a bit about oil in Uganda. I have a, my information up here if you ever want to reach out, as well as a QR code for surveys from the Pulitzer Center. Um, and hopefully, um, I've, I've, I've tried to leave plenty of time um, for questions if we'd like to do that. Yes, go ahead. Um, the rights of the people, I understand, has been looked at in a different way as far as the rights of the land. Uh, the IIC here on campus has talked about, uh, has had a few different programs, and people are attacking it in a different way, um, where if corporations have rights, uh, I'm not sure what it is in Uganda, but can the land also have rights? That's such a good point. Um, I think why I particularly like the quote from Max about sort of the land providing for his future is because the rights of the people and the rights of the land feel really interconnected um, in this specific case. Um, I'll be honest, I most of my sort of reporting focused very specifically on sort of the human rights issue, that human rights and climate change are undeniably interconnected. Um, but I think sort of to your point about the land having rights, so many of the people I spoke to felt like they weren't just upset to be losing their crops or not being paid enough, they were upset to be losing land on which their fathers and grandfathers or their mothers and grandmothers had lived or land in which they would buried loved ones or sort of crops which meant they could send their children to school. So it's deeply interconnected. Um, I don't know sort of the specifics of the like land rights issue legally, but I'd love to look into it for you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, first off, thanks for your talk and your reporting, which is incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Um, what is the state of the press, the free press in Uganda? And what relationship does a reporter like you um, have with journalists on the ground in Uganda? That's a wonderful question. Um, and I think the answer is that it's complicated. Um, Uganda is really, really interesting because if you show up and you're, I don't know, a tourist in Kampala, you might get the impression that there is a thriving free press. There are a lot of radio stations um, and there are sort of two, at least two major newspapers um, in Kampala, if not more. Um, but sort of beyond that image of, of, press, of press freedom, everything is very tightly controlled. There's a great deal of self-censorship. Um, and something I'm looking into now is just how many of the sort of radio stations and papers in the country are actually owned by the first family or by people close to them. 
Um, that being said, Ugandan journalists are doing ridiculously brave work every day and often taking on a lot more risks than foreign journalists like myself. Um, something that really struck me during the elections um, in 2021, though I didn't cover it directly, is that while well, foreign journalists um, were running through tear gas and having their visas taken away, Ugandan journalists were often being directly fired upon, and I think that needs to be said um, clearly. Um, and a big part of um, why it felt important to report this story as I did as a foreign journalist is it felt like I was able to take um, risks that a Ugandan journalist might not have been able to take. Um, a completely separate issue is that I think we should constantly be interrogating what our role is as outsiders in journalism, if we still need a foreign press corps, if I, Sophie Neiman, a young American woman, need to be in Uganda and Congo. But I do think there are things that can be said when you have the privilege of an American passport, and that is what sort of spurred on a lot of my reporting on oil. So that's a very long answer, but I hope I, I got to part of your question. Yeah, go ahead. One of your published pieces um, has the title of the, something like the hypocrisy of the yeah. West. Could you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, that was a piece I wrote for a publication I often work with called World Politics Review, sort of while pulling together parts of this investigation. Um, and what I thought was really interesting and wanted to get into was the dynamics of countries like France um, trying to move away from fossil fuel dependency while also supporting a company like Total um, working, um, working in Uganda. I think there was a week, uh, Macron, who, who, who pres sorry, President Macron, who'd called for the project to be fast-tracked, had also spoken a lot about in sort of decreasing France's um, dependency on fossil fuels. So I was trying to get into that dynamic, as well as sort of challenge the broader narratives that places like, like the Ugandan government and Total Energies often use about the pipeline and saying that criticism of it is a form of neocolonialism to look at the way in which countries were sort of offloading their fossil fuel costs to Africa. I hope th hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, go ahead, Max. Um, so when talking to your sources and talking to all these people that you've met, I imagine this experience of having their land being taken and their bodies being brutalized is something that is probably very traumatic for them. Yeah. When talking and engaging with them, how do you like work to address the trauma that they're experiencing, especially in like how you report it? Yeah, that's such a good question and something that I think about a lot um, as a journalist. I feel like it is often our job to talk to people about the most difficult days um, of their lives and that it's so important as a result to go in with compassion and understanding of that trauma and never demand that anyone um, tells you their story. Um, and that ethos really guided so much of my reporting on this. And for the people who were sort of the main sources in the piece, um, like Jealousy Mugisha, um, who was fighting for a home in Bulisa, um, and Maxwell Atuhora, who's the um, activist who'd been um, arrested. I think we spent nearly as much time sitting and eating meals together and talking about our families as we did talking about the oil pipeline. Um, it was a process of building the type of deep trust you would with anyone you cared about, as well as making sure that they knew that this wasn't their voice wasn't something I expected, no matter how many times we chatted or spent time together outside of work, that it was their choice to be part of this story um, and, and that it was um, that anything I reported, especially given the level of trauma they were suffering as a result of their activism, could be on their terms. Yes? Um, towards the end of your talk, you um, spoke very briefly about the sexual exploitation yeah. of girls and women. Could you maybe talk about yeah. that? Yeah, um, I mean, I want to be clear that that is, that is speculative on my part and something that I think should be clear is speculative rather than reported as fact. But a number of organizations I spoke to who are working along the pipeline route sort of spoke about um, the danger of construction, of sort of their fears over construction workers coming in and the potential harm that could cause to women in the community. Um, what I, what I sort of wish I'd said, based on your question, is that it was provoking that fear rather than that direct danger. But the fear was certainly there. Um, and it was even more acute um, in Hoima, where the refinery is being built and where some people had already been moved into new land um, for a refinery. There's a lot of complaints about sort of the danger 
of, of, of danger posed by construction workers, but um, I, I feel like I misspoke. I think I should have said a fear rather than a direct danger. No, I was, um, I'm curious. I'm starting a research project on um, transition mineral mining, uh, green transition of mining. Oh, cool. Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm, I'm trying to incorporate a gender aspect into it, and one of the things I'm looking into is the sexual exploitation yeah. that, that can happen. So I was just curious if there was a link in, yeah. in, in, in this. Um, I mean, it, something I'm super passionate about. I would love to chat more about your research later. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, but yeah, it's, um, in my experience, it was more like a fear than a direct link, but I think the link can really be there and is often ignored within the human rights stories, especially given sort of linking back to what you said, Maxwell, about how sensitive it can be to report those things. Yes. Within Uganda, is there like direct evidence of who's really profiting? Like, is it are there a lot of elites who have stakes um, in this pipeline, or with like the development and the money that's supposed to come out of it? Is there like one group that is more likely to profit than others? That's another amazing question, um, and I think it really depends on who you talk to. Um, if you sit in a bar in Kampala and bring up oil, um, someone might say that they believe only the first family is going to profit. Um, that being said, I think there's also a lot of distrust of the first family in general in certain circles, so any project comes in, people say only the first family will profit. Um, this does have, I think, revenues of 70 billion over its lifespan and a direct sort of 1 billion value add to Ugandan government coffers each year, which is huge in the context of a country like Uganda, and that's not to mention additional contracts to Ugandan businesses um, and potential jobs and industries that pop up because of oil but aren't directly related to oil itself. Um, which is all to say there's suspicion that this will only benefit elites, um, but the argument being made sort of by the Ugandan government is that this is something that will directly contribute to development in the country. Um, it should be said that Total Energy still owns the majority stake in the pipeline um, and that this is an export pipeline. So however you feel about our dependence on fossil fuels, um, the oil is going to international markets. Some of it will be refined in Uganda, but the majority of it is going out to international markets. Sorry, you looked like you had a question. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this in a way that just make it sound like this is inherently bad because I don't think it's Go for it. I I did this presentation at like another place, and they were that they that they really challenged me on a lot of things. I can take it. Go oh, for I'm it. Not, I'm not. It's not even a challenge. Um, it's just I'm curious. You mentioned how this story was all-consuming for you, um, and I'm just curi curious as a journalist how you deal with that. Um, and that's why I mean, like, I don't think it's inherently bad to be like super focused on what you're working on. But I'm just wondering, like, yeah, does it ever get like? overwhelming and like how do you do that's such a good question i mean my poor partner heard me complain about oil all of the time for like a year um but i think there's this really difficult and important line to walk that applies to journalism to research or any job where you're sort of in direct contact with people where i often feel like i am the luckiest person in the situation i get the choice to leave if I want to. I'm in a lot less danger um, than a lot of my sources. And I think that's really important to say, um, but it doesn't make it um, any less traumatic sometimes. And there were so many days when I would do interviews for this story and just need to go home and cry or completely turn off my brain and watch a dumb TV show. Um, and I think acknowledging that is really important because then we can find ways to take care of ourselves and to take a break when we need it um, or set boundaries if we have to. And I think that's vital in, in really any type of work. Um, and so it's just a wonderful question. Anything else? Yes. I keep worrying about the gentleman who's held off on farming his coffee because he was in expectation of a payment. Yeah. I, I guess I'm asking. Um, what would you say would be sort of an immediate good response or sort of happier outcome or long term? Because in a way, if you, there are people who have been 
if you stop the project now, you have people who've been in expectation of something. I guess I'm thinking, do you, are they active, what are they fighting for? Are they helping? What would be a good outcome? Ugh. I'm trying to figure out how to help the people who've been. That is if it were to stop now, they're still without anything. Do you see what I'm saying? I love that question, and it's one that I thought about constantly when I was reporting on this. Because um, I, Sophie Neiman, like often feel like maybe we should I very strongly feel that we should be reducing our dependency on fossil fuels. Um, but that's an opinion I sort of felt like I had to set aside as much as possible when working on this piece. And so many of the farmers I spoke to, I very much expected to say, we never want oil to come here. Um, we don't like this project. And their answer, because of the exact dynamic you just identified, was actually kind of the opposite. It was that we do want oil, we do want development, but we want to be paid fairly. Um, and so I don't know what the best outcome is. Um, I think it should be said very clearly that the way in which Total Energies and its partners in the Ugandan government handled the compensation process was itself deeply harmful because it left people waiting and then not being paid enough money which one lawyer I spoke to said could be a potential violation of a very complex part of Ugandan law. But that doesn't mean that the best outcome is now to completely stop, stop the project, no matter how much we want to say no to new fossil fuel development. So I really don't know. What I will say, and I wish I'd had more space to get into this um, and the reporting, and I'll maybe look into it now, is there is division um, between activists themselves. There are big movements um, by people in, um, in France in particular, but also activist groups in Kenya and elsewhere on the African continent that sort of unite under the moniker Stop ECOP and want to cut off the project entirely. Um, the European Union um, Parliament called to delay the project for at least a year to answer questions of human rights abuse and um, environmental abuse, but then there are people within the Ugandan context who say, okay, like activists in particular, who want, who are fine with the project continuing um, as long as they're fairly paid. Um, someone who sort of was mentioned in passing in the presentation is a man named Keinga Mudu Ishitu, who works in um, Masaka actually directly with Edward Kazibu, the coffee farmer, who basically said, okay, we know oil is coming, we just want people to be paid fairly. Um, so it's complicated. That doesn't answer your question at all. That just gives you some <laughs> perspective. Two separate issues, two separate. Yeah. And then real fast, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if one thing you're up against too, thinking of Macron and the cold winter and, the, and with the shortage with Russian oil no longer a push, is that somehow influencing people? Like we need to get oil from wherever it happens, but they don't want to necessarily say that. That is a great question. Actually, Museveni um, wrote an op-ed in the Telegraph which is a somewhat conservative paper in the UK, talking about how great it would be if people could get oil from friendlier nations. Um, so absolutely that dynamic is 100% at play and something I need to look into more. <laughs> Any, yes? I have one more question. Absolutely. And so it's about your writing, which is really, truly uh, captivating. It, it's, Great Thank you. To you. I have good that. editors. <laughs> what I yeah, that's kind of my question. So, are there like how many drafts do you do? If, are there times when you like are looking at a blank screen and you don't know what to say? What's it What's it been like to write these pieces? So draining. Um, so, for the sort of biggest piece in the New York Review of Books, which ended up being about a four thousand word investigation expose, I think I wrote my first draft. Um, six months into the process, um, and I sent it off to my editors and they sort of sat on it, as often happens with big publications. Um, and so then took those six months to do even more research, sort of another six months to do even more research, and went back to Uganda, and then was incredibly glad that they'd sort of sat on it because I found out so much more. And so then I started writing another draft um, and that involved like six different outlines, piecing it together, at least two or three drafts myself, sitting in like my friend's house at midnight after everyone had gone to bed, um, traveling to report another story, all the crazy things journalists do. Sent that to my editor, and then I think there were three or four more drafts between the two of us before it was finally, um, finally published. So it very much takes multiple drafting, redrafting, and then the support of really smart editors who know what they're doing. 
Anybody else? It's a small enough group that if we're good on time, you can feel free to shout out questions to me. Is it hard to get, um, I know you're pitching stories all the time. Is it hard sometimes to get interest in a certain area? Like people say, oh, that's not the top thing right now. We're not just focused on Uganda or Africa. Or since you focus on African stories, are you finding that they are responsive with internet? I generally find people to be fairly responsive, but I also work for pretty specific publications um, that do have um, like, like a general interest in the region that I cover, and it's part of why I work for them. Um, that being said, like it's, it's still a, a challenge and one that often feels um, unjust. I've pitched and had rejected an article on the M23 conflict um, in, in Congo by a handful of publications because they've already covered it, whereas similar publications will publish five, ten different articles on the conflict. Um, in Ukraine. So I've had a lot of luck, but that's not to say there isn't sort of a level of unevenness in terms of how Africa gets covered. Yeah. Mechanics. Yeah, go for how it. How many different stories are you working on at any given time? And how challenging is that to kind of advance on all of those fronts? It's sort of like the best, worst thing ever. Because um, you're, it, which sounds, cliche or overly optimistic, but I really mean it, because you're constantly getting to work on something that you're passionate about. But usually in a given sort of two-week period, I'm writing one story and pitching the next. So unless it is a really big piece like this oil one, which took about a year and was constantly doing other stories on top of, I try and within a month period get about two big stories done. Um, it doesn't always work out that way. There are times when I sort of have things lined up almost so quickly I can't handle them, and there are times when you're sitting at your computer sending out pitches and getting rejections that when I was first starting out kind of felt like getting rejected by like a date. You'd be like, please, <laughs> just care about this, and then they would just, it, they already had already covered it, didn't want it, yeah. So it really depends. Anybody else? I'm oh, sorry, I have to do this for a colleague. Where did you study abroad? Um, I studied abroad in Rwanda, actually, um, with a program called the School for International Training, um, and then went back to Rwanda after I'd graduated, um, completely fell in love with living in East Africa, and that sort of started me on a long and sort of twisty path to trying to become a freelance journalist. Um, yes? You mentioned a lot of rejections at the beginning. How do you think that moved to... How did you get from rejections to actually having a successful career? That's a lovely question. Also, thank you for calling me successful. <laughs> Very nice of you. Um, I think it's about learning on your feet. Um, I've, getting to be here and talk on behalf of Pulitzer has made me think a lot about what the market is for journalism right now. And when I was starting out, it just sort of felt like freelancing was the best way to get a foot in the door. Um, because of the reality of how few jobs there are in journalism. Um, and it was very much a process of learning on my feet and trying to make connections between things I was seeing in the communities I was working in and coming and like falling in love with and connecting those with the bigger sort of more global issues I wanted um, to cover. And learning when an editor would take a certain piece if I got lucky trying to figure out why, learning why they were rejecting them, um, figuring out if I thought they were right about the rejection so I could really learn from it, um, and then at the same time getting better and quicker with asking for interviews, lining up sources, trying to really peel back the curtain. And I think, yeah, it was, it was I think with any job, not just journalism, very much a process of learning on my feet to do something that is just, I, I mean, it's such an honor to get to do this. Um, I sometimes feel absolutely wild that this is my job. Well, thank you so much. This was lovely. I, you look like, I'll just. Yeah, I was just gonna, yeah, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.